Hello and welcome back. This is the week four lecture. So this week we're going to talk about description and descriptive writing. So description and narration really go hand in hand. They are closely related. Uh, you will normally find both working together in some way. And much like narration, we are already pretty familiar with description. I don't need to tell you guys what it means to describe a person, place, or thing. We're already pretty familiar with what that is and why it's important. I mean, like narration, description is a really essential part of human speech. Uh, we use it all the time, and it shows up in all different sorts of writing, in almost all forms of writing. So this week we're going to sort of enhance our own descriptive abilities by looking at some examples of descriptive writing in 50 essays. And of course, we're also going to be practicing some of these techniques and soon because next week we're going to be putting together our descriptive essays. That, of course, will be our first major essay assignment of the semester and we're spending all of week five putting together outlines and drafts and then of course by the end of week five final drafts will be due. So we don't have a whole lot of time to spend on description just one week but again we're sort of adding description on to what we've already learned about narratives. So we should be ready to put together our own descriptive narratives by next week. So today I just want to go over some basic terms and concepts that you guys need to know about description. So go ahead and uh, enter Web Campus, go to the week four module and take a look at the overview. You can find all of the terms that I'm about to define. They are all there in the overview. No PowerPoint this week. Uh, I don't have a lot of new information, but I mostly just want to go over some examples and sort of illustrate what I mean with some of these descriptive terms. So again, I want you to add these terms to all of our narrative elements that we've been working with for the last couple of weeks. And by the end of this week, you're going to have a whole collection of tools and techniques that you'll be able to first identify as a reader and then use soon as a writer as we continue to work on both of those areas. So let me start by talking a little bit about the difference between objective description and subjective description. So again, you can find all of the definitions in the overview, but I just want to go over them again out loud and you can follow along. So the key thing to remember with objective descriptions is when you're describing things in this way, your number one goal is to strive for maximum accuracy, precision. Uh, there's no emotion involved when you're putting together an objective description. So you're often going to find these types of descriptions in news reports or science writing or maybe even in encyclopedias. You're going to find this in places where personal opinions aren't really supposed to matter. These are descriptions of various subjects that don't have anything to do with the author's feelings or personal experiences. We are simply looking for accuracy. We're looking for detail and we're looking for all of the information about the subject, whatever person, place, or thing is being described. We're just looking for all of the info about that subject that we need. So objective descriptions are kind of bloodless. You might think of them that way. They're kind of neutral and they don't involve emotion. Obviously, subjective descriptions will be the opposite. <laughs> they are really drawn from the emotions of the writer. So in this case, the writer invests the subject that he or she is describing with the feelings, uh, experiences, sensations that the writer might associate with the subjects being described. So in this case, the writer is really using uh, his or her emotional relationship to the subject to help sort of guide or dictate the description. 
So if you have positive feelings about a particular place or a particular object, you as the writer will allow those positive feelings to sort of drive your description. You're going to emphasize the positive or the beautiful uh, qualities of these particular things because these things make you happy or you like to look at them. They bring you some kind of satisfaction or you feel like they are meaningful or, uh, you know, generally enjoyable for whatever reason. So those feelings of happiness, enjoyment, aesthetic appreciation, those positive feelings will lead you to create a positive description that really emphasizes the specific characteristics of that subject that make you feel good, that make you enjoy whatever it is. Conversely, if you have a negative association or a negative feeling about a particular subject, your description will reflect that. So with subjective descriptions, uh, it's really all about emotion. It's all about personal feelings. And the descriptions are really working to capture the writer's state of mind and personal sort of orientation toward the subject being described. So... Obviously, we're going to find more subjective descriptions in works of literature, in fiction, and the sorts of narratives uh, that we might be seeing, although they are certainly not all fiction, but they contain elements of fiction. They are somewhat literary. They are interesting stories that are full of emotion and different experiences in different places, and... Uh, Clearly, the descriptions are largely based on the writer's feelings, <laughs> memories, and the positive or negative associations that the writers might have with particular people, places, and things. But no matter what kind of description you're dealing with, whether it's objective or subjective, you're always going to have a dominant impression at the heart of the description. You should think of dominant impression as sort of being like the narrative point of a description. Remember, we talked about narrative point last week and the week before. That just means the theme of a narrative, the overall meaning of a narrative. Well, descriptions sort of have the same thing. The dominant impression is the central theme or idea about the subject that a description is trying to get across, is trying to convey. So as the reader, you need to be aware of what the dominant impression is. What is the writer trying to express about this particular subject, about this particular place, this person, this character, or maybe even an object or an animal? What's the main takeaway? How are we supposed to feel about this particular thing that's being described. So again, look at how it's described. Look at which qualities or, or characteristics are being emphasized or sort of uh, developed in the most detail. And we can talk a little bit more about some of the things to look for. But the dominant impression is just like the theme of the description, the overall point or meaning of a particular description. So that's a really important term to remember and make sure you write down a definition for it. So we also are going to talk a little bit about uh, developing specific details. And that can mean a lot of different things. But you have to ask yourself as a writer, as we turn to our own essays soon, you have to ask yourself, what details do I need to include in order for this thing that I'm describing to really come to life? in order to make the readers see what I want them to see, hear what I want them to hear, or think what I want them to think. So again, if you're thinking about describing a person, you need to determine what personal characteristics you want to emphasize. Height, hair color, <laughs> uh, there's a lot to choose from and you might not be able to cover all of it. If you're describing uh, a particular uh, location, a particular place, what do you want to emphasize? Uh, vegetation, the sky, there might be water involved. You could always talk about uh, weather. You can always talk about, uh, you know, climate as well, temperature. Uh, these are all things that are, are available to you. You just have to decide what is most important. 
Uh, so I included some videos in the week four module. I recommend you guys checking those out, particularly the one that's just called Describing Scenes. It's the one with the young kind of man who's doing these hand gestures. Um, that's a really good, short, kind of easy way to start describing. So he just offers some really simple strategies. Like if you're looking at a river, you know, uh, surrounded on each side with trees, just start describing that scene by picking out all the details that you notice and just go in order. What do you notice first? What do you notice next? <laughs> you can talk about the water. You can talk about the sky. You can talk about the trees. And as you keep going, you're going to keep noticing more. So you can develop that description more and more. Now, of course, that works well if you're looking at the thing that you're describing. As we start writing, you guys are going to have to maybe do some of this work in your minds. But also next week, we're going to talk about some pre-writing strategies, some brainstorming uh, and some other sort of idea generation strategies that will help you guys to get started with some of this. But there are lots of simple strategies and I've posted those videos in the week four module. The other couple are describing particular scenes or their videos, their, their, their particular scenes in nature. One is a beach in California, the other is uh, a harbor in South Africa. And you're just being asked to describe what you see, but <laughs> I like how they do it because they give you multiple rounds. So round one is just hit the the obvious stuff water boats you know sand <laughs> rocks all the things you immediately notice but then they want you to go back and if you watch the entire videos they're short but they do ask you to go back and sort of look again and chances are you're going to notice additional details so that's kind of a fun exercise just to learn how to be, a, 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 to help us become sort of better noticers <laughs> uh, when we're reading. Uh, but we also want to kind of keep a lot of that in mind as we start writing. Because when you're trying to describe a place, uh, maybe even the interior of somebody's home or the, the physical description of a person, a lot of that's about decisions. A lot of that's about choices that you have to make. What are you going to emphasize? What details are you going to include? And which details are you going to leave out? So I've also mentioned uh, organization in the overview. So once you kind of have a list of details, you need to organize them. So again, go back to our narrative stuff. This should remind you of the key narrative events and the narrative sequence. So remember a couple of weeks ago, I told you that the narrative events basically equal the plot, all the major events, all the things that happen in the story. When you're writing, you need to have a list of those, <laughs> just all of, all of the things that are important that you want to include and talk about. And then once you have that list, you need to start organizing those events. What order? Are the events going to occur in? Are we going to go in chronological order? Might we have flashbacks or flash forwards? How are we going to sort of unfold all of these events of our narrative? So that's the organizational part. So you have the events of the plot and then you have the, the sequence or the organizational plan for that plot. Well, description kind of works that way. That same way, we have descriptive details Great, we can have a long list of a lot of different details that are in no particular order. That's great, but now we have to organize them. We have to figure out how we are going to present all of these details. How are we going to present the information to the reader? So I've given you a few basic choices and we don't have to pick one at the expense of the others. We can kind of use all three. It's just nice to know of some different ways to organize your descriptive details. So one example uh, is a spatial pattern. So this means you're describing things based on spatial relationships, based on where things are located in space. So it's sort of like geographical. Uh, so if you're describing a city as you walk it on foot, you could describe how buildings are located. This building is next to this building. I walked down this street and then I took a left on this other street. While I was on this other street, I saw this building followed by that building. I saw 
people doing whatever. But everything's kind of arranged based on spatial relationships, based on movement and where you are sort of <laughs> in space, right? The way things relate to one another, uh, things that are next to each other, th how things are sort of arranged or laid out. Uh, so that can be one way to organize details. Another way is chronological, which we've already talked about this term. That just means you're going from start to finish. So if I'm describing my first day at work, I would start perhaps with the morning, waking up in the morning, and then I go to work, and then I'm at work, and I take my lunch, and I meet people, and I do work throughout the afternoon, then I go home, I eat dinner, I go to bed. So I could follow a chronological sequence throughout the day. But I don't have to go in a linear, forward, chronological fashion. You can use time to help you organize your details, even if you're not going from earliest to latest or from past <laughs> up to present. You can go backwards in time. You can jump around, but you can still use time as sort of an organizing principle. You can sort of describe things based on time. You can describe what you saw at this time, followed by what you saw at the next time or an earlier time or whatever chronology you happen to be using. And then the final sort of organizational option is emphatic. That just means you're arranging the details based on their importance, perhaps most important first, <laughs> uh, you know, moving, you know, down to the least important or perhaps it's in the other order, but you're arranging those details just based on their importance, perhaps to the overall plot, uh, perhaps to their, based on their importance to your overall theme or narrative point. But again, these are all choices that you, as the writer, will be making, right? <laughs> these are your calls. Um, but again, if we're moving through space and time as we're describing different things, be sure to use what we call signal devices. And I don't think I included this in the overview, but I'll put some of these words and phrases up in this week's module. I'll also put them in the week five module because we need to use some of these words and phrases in our own essays. These are ways to help guide our readers, to help uh, make sure that our readers stay oriented, to make sure they understand where they are in time and space. So these are words like first, next, alongside, nearby, Right? These are words that help establish spatial relationships or time relationships. First, I saw this. Next, I found myself in, then I was alongside, whatever. Um, I found myself nearby another thing. So we're, we're establishing these spatial relationships, but these particular words will help us to start sentences and create connections between different sentences and different thoughts. You know, first, later, those will help us uh, with, with time relationships. And then even phrases like worst of all or better yet can help move us Perhaps if we're doing emphatic, we can move from important to more or least important details. So these are just good words and phrases to help keep the reader organized. And I'll post some of those later. Another term that I did remember to include in the week four overview is point of view. And I'm trying to point out that we already talked about this term, I know, in relation to narratives. We talked about first-person narration style versus third-person narration style. And I asked you guys to think a little bit about who the narrator is. Is the narrator a character? Is the narrator the protagonist, which often means we're seeing a first-person narration style? Or do we have an omniscient uh, sort of objective third person narrator who doesn't exactly exist in the story but seems to know what everybody is thinking <laughs> and what everybody all the characters are doing so we've already discussed that but again description is similar to narration but a little different so here point of view means something slightly different in this case when we're talking about description the question is still basically the same who's telling the story like who is doing the describing but more importantly 
what is that person's relationship to the objects or people or places that he or she is describing? That's what point of view really means with description. So we're thinking about sort of two different types of point of view. We're thinking about physical relationships and we're thinking about psychological relationships. So when it comes to physical, that just means uh, what is the narrator's sort of physical relationship with whatever it is that's being described. So if you are describing a mountain, <laughs> what is your physical relationship to that mountain? Are you on the ground looking up at the mountain? Are you at the top of the mountain having already climbed it? And are you looking down from the summit? Are you currently climbing the mountain? Are you halfway up? But these things matter, right? Because your physical location, uh, your physical relationship with the mountain will influence your description. Things are going to look one way when you're at the bottom and they're going to look a very different way when you're at the top looking down. So that's just something to keep in mind. And then when it comes to psychological, this takes us back to what we were discussing with subjective descriptions. How do you feel about the mountain? Uh, did, a, did, a, did, did some tragedy happen to you? Uh, do you associate some bad thing with this mountain? If so, your description might take on a negative quality. You might emphasize the fear or the dread that this mountain makes you feel. But if you love this mountain, if you have positive associations with this mountain, if you've had good experiences with it, then that's obviously going to create a very different type of description. So physical, where are you? And then psychological, how do you feel about whatever it is? you're described. All right, so another thing I mentioned in the week four module, I talk a little bit about verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. So I actually went back and added a few additional details to the overview just because I wanted to give you guys some examples uh, of, the, of the kinds of vivid adjectives and strong verbs that I want to see in your own descriptions. So I've given a few examples and I'm going to expound on them a little bit here in lecture before I wrap up. Because to me, this might be kind of the most important thing I can sort of give you guys here in week four. It's just a heightened awareness of word choice. We talked about word choice with, narr uh, with narratives. Uh, every word counts. And that's especially true when you're describing things because your language really matters. Now, picking out good details, that's great. Uh, and that's going to help you to arrive at better language choices. But you also, it's not just the details themselves, it's the way you express those details. Uh, and that's where verbs and adjectives really come in. So I just wanted to give you guys some quick examples of how you can sort of make your writing just a little more powerful, a little more memorable, and you can do a better job of creating imagery because that's another term that you'll notice uh, in the week four overview. And of course, we've already talked about imagery. We've already talked about sensory impressions, uh, but they are very important when it comes to description. Really good descriptions tap in to our senses. Good descriptions make us see, they make us hear, they might even make us feel, uh, they can make us smell, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, taste, they can cover all five, but of course the visual image will be the most common. But good verbs and adjectives will really help to make your descriptions come alive. So when I say vivid adjectives, I want you to think about the word vivid. That means producing strong feelings and clear images. That's all that word means. And that's exactly what we want to do with our descriptions. We want to create strong feelings in our readers and we want to paint clear images in their minds. That, that, those are sort of two signs of successful descriptions. So let's talk about some adjectives here. So I've, I've put a few examples in the module. So I said, you know, instead of describing a loud noise as very loud, why not deafening? See, deafening is a strong, specific adjective. 
and it really captures what you're going for. Now, very loud is not incorrect. It's not bad. It's simply not memorable. The language isn't going to stick in your reader's minds, but deafening is just a more, it just makes more of an impression and it captures the same meaning, but you'll notice we can capture very loud with just one word, a better word, a more specific word. So not only is our, uh, is our writing a little more fun and exciting now, it's also more efficient because instead of using two words to express what we're trying to express, we can use one better word. And there are lots of examples of this. Uh, instead of saying that something hurt really badly, just call it excruciating. See, that's a stronger descriptor. That's a stronger adjective that really captures what the character is going through in fewer words, and it will make more of an impression on readers. Instead of telling us that a character is very happy uh, or feeling very good, why don't you say that he is thrilled or she is elated? These are better adjectives. They're stronger. They really capture what we're going for. And again, they can do it more efficiently than multiple sort of weak words like very happy or quite good or very loud. Uh, so just try to replace the weak descriptors with stronger descriptors, stronger adjectives like those examples I just ran through. Now let's also think about adverbs a little bit. I don't want to linger too much on grammar because that's usually when people tune out <laughs> or go to sleep. But just remember that adverbs modify verbs, uh, adjectives, or in some cases other adjectives adverbs. So you don't really need to remember that definition, but just notice that a lot of times when we need to modify a verb or another adjective, a strong adverb can help to drive home our point. But again, we need to use strong, specific words. So I actually pulled this one from one of our readings in week four, the Danny Chow uh, essay about hot chicken. At one point he describes, I think himself, or maybe somebody else, as sweating profusely. So if you look up profusely, it just means a lot, right? Excessive amounts. So we could say that the character is sweating a lot, but that's boring. That's bland and nobody is going to remember that. Sweating profusely, see in this case profusely is the adverb. It's modifying the verb sweating, right? So sweating is the action. <laughs> but then a good strong adverb like profusely helps to really make that action come alive. So now we have an image of somebody who has sweat pouring down their face because the chicken is so hot. So another example, uh, I tapped my foot impatiently as I waited for my friend to get ready. So here's an example of how good, strong word choice can help to express meaning and can help to tell us more about characters. So in the scene that I'm describing here in this made up narrative, I'm waiting for my friend. If I don't include an extra descriptor like impatiently, it might not be clear to readers what my mental state is as I'm waiting for my friend. If my sentence simply reads, I sat there waiting for my friend, I sat there tapping my foot waiting for my friend, well, maybe we can guess that a foot tap is an impatient gesture, but maybe not. Some people just do it idly. Some people just do it without thinking. But if I tell you that I was tapping my foot impatiently, or I was impatiently tapping. Uh, now, I'm not only describing my action, tapping my foot as I wait, I'm also telling you how I feel. And I'm doing it efficiently. I don't have to spend a whole nother sentence or two telling you I was impatient, I was frustrated, I was tired of waiting. I can simply tack on a single adverb to help give you more detail about the action. This was an action that was born out of impatience. <laughs> so now you know what I'm doing action-wise, 
as a character and you know why I'm doing it, how I feel, and just sort of my state of mind. And just one word helps us to do all of that. So that's just a better route to take. Another example, uh, it's not just very slow or really slow, it's unbelievably slow. So here, unbelievably is much like impatiently or profusely. It's just extra detail. It's, extra, it's an extra level of specificity to make the actions or the things being described really come alive. You guys should try to avoid words like really, very, a lot. Those aren't strong words. So in a text message and casual writing and an email, they're fine. But when you're doing description, when you're trying to write good descriptive language, uh, th those words don't help you. Those words don't really mean very much. They're vague. They don't really drive home what you want them to drive home. But we can replace them with more descriptive, specific much stronger words. So I hope this makes sense. So let's talk a little bit about verbs and then I'll wrap it up. So again, we have choices. I could describe a character as walking slowly, uh, walking slowly to class. Now we might know or have some, uh, some ideas about what this character is thinking or feeling, but the description itself doesn't really deliver a lot of information. It tells us that the character is walking and it tells us that the character is walking slowly. Okay, great, but there are a lot of different reasons why a person might walk slowly. So what if I replace that weak verb phrase, walked slowly or is walking slowly, why don't I replace it with a better verb? Something like shuffled. If you guys look up the word shuffled, it has multiple meanings. It might mean that you're about to play cards, but it also, the first meaning, the first definition you should see is walking uh, in such a way that you don't pick your feet up from the ground. And oftentimes you might be looking down at the ground while you shuffle. So shuffling has certain connotations. If I'm not picking my feet up from the ground, if my eyes are down, you can kind of guess that probably means I'm upset or maybe I'm nervous, maybe I don't want to go to class, maybe there's a test I'm not prepared for, uh, there, but it's telling us more about the character. The character is shuffling. Uh, so now we get an image of somebody who's not only walking slowly, but might be kind of downcast. And maybe we can even hear their feet sort of sliding on the ground. And we have a better idea of this character's state of mind, how this character feels and what this character's all about. So again, we get the action that's being described, the walking, but we get more. Not just walk slowly, okay, whatever, who cares? Now we know more because we know the character is shuffling. And that, sh that word might bring certain associations to mind, or it might not. We can just look it up <laughs> as readers and see, oh, he's barely picking his feet up off the ground. And now we're thinking about what that means. So that's a better way of describing. Another example, you could say run fast or you could say sprinted. Uh, means the same thing, but you're achieving your goals with fewer words and with stronger words. And the final example, uh, again, choices. I was very happy as I walked home that day. Well, that's an okay sentence. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. Will anybody remember it? Will it make anybody feel strong emotions? <laughs> or uh, will it create good imagery in the minds of our readers? No, probably not. But I could replace it with the following. I was so happy that I glided home that day. And if we look up the word glide, it means to move in an easy rhythmic motion. So that, again, it brings associations, connotations to mind. If I'm gliding, then 
I mean, we, we obviously know how I'm feeling at that point. So we could even take the word happy out. I glided home after the date. I glided home after acing my test. Now I don't even have to tell my readers that I'm happy because based on context and based on the descriptive language I'm using, this strong verb, I'm communicating the mental state of the character. I don't even have to say that he's happy. It might become obvious just through my word choice. Or again, if I'm really happy, something really good happened to me, maybe I'll say that I floated home. Because if you float, of course, you're hovering above the surface. And this is actually an example of figurative language as well, because I didn't literally float home. Maybe I can literally glide. I don't think I have the rhythm or the natural grace of movement to do that, but some humans can. But no human uh, <laughs> can actually float. So if I use that word, I'm speaking figuratively. Right, I'm leaving the literal realm and I'm telling you I'm so happy, I'm feeling so good, I feel so light that it's like I'm floating. So that's actually a metaphor. But more importantly for our purposes now, it's a really good way to describe what a character is doing and how a character is feeling. So I strongly recommend as you guys continue to read, let's look for these descriptive elements. Look for the verbs and the adjectives and maybe even the adverbs that these authors are using. Think about physical point of view when you're reading descriptions and then think about psychological and then try to find the dominant impression of most of the descriptions that you see. So again, watch the videos, check out the reading assignment. We have two different reading assignments this week, one for the fifth edition and one for the sixth. So just make sure you're looking at the right one. Uh, of course, we have a discussion post typical week, but this is our final week of instruction before we start working on essay one. So next week, week five, is going to be a little different. I won't really have much of a lecture. I'm just going to give you guys some pre-writing strategies at the beginning of the week so we can get started on outlines. And then by the end of the week, I hope, or really by like Thursday, <laughs> uh, maybe Friday, I'd like, to have, I'd like everybody to have rough drafts completed. And then of course you'll have the weekend to make some revisions and edits and get the final drafts in. So I'll have a lot more information about the writing process next week. And I'll give you some strategies. We'll kind of work through several stages of the process together. And then you'll submit final drafts at the end of the week. All right. So I'll see you next week. If you have any questions about essay topics, again, you're totally free. Uh, you'll see the assignment posted later this week. And of course, we'll talk about it more next week. But you get to choose what you want your narratives to be about. You can make up a fictional story or you can base your narrative like Orwell, like Hughes, like other authors that we've seen. You can base your narratives uh, on real events, real things that happened to you, <laughs> uh, whatever you like. But if you want to run an idea by me, if you're not quite sure about a potential topic for a narrative, we can talk through email. Just let me know if you have any questions or problems, and I will see you next week.